Aral recommended two uses of the fingers. The first was vigorous high finger action. Arau's high finger action was not the so-called hammer touch recommended by some 19th century pedagogues where the fingers were raised independently of the arm and held in a tightly curved shape. Arau's high finger motion is re reinforced by arm weight and movement. The fingers are somewhat straightened and most of the finger movement takes place in the knuckle joint, though the other joints move somewhat as well. So therefore we might say that rather than being curved, the fingers are curving as they depress the keys. The second use of the fingers recommended by Arau was very minimal finger motion. Arau sometimes instructed students not to move their fingers. He did not mean that the fingers should be completely immobile, but that they should remain in contact with the keys or very close to them. The keys are then pressed down by the weight of the arm, and the fingers support that weight with very small pulling movements that catch the weight in the key beds. Arau taught two uses of the arm, dropping down and pushing up and away from the body. In dropping the arm, the fingers are poised just above the keys. Then the entire arm is lifted and released so that its weight drops into the keyboard, supported by the fingers. As the arm is lifted from the shoulder, the forearm and hand hang down loosely so that the fingers remain close to or touching the keys. As the arm lifts, the point of the elbow must turn outward in proportion to the height that is reached by the arm. So in this way, the arm can be lifted high while the fingers stay close to the keyboard. The other use of the arm is pushing upward. This movement begins with the fingers already touching the keys. The keys are pressed down while pushing the arm forward and making the wrists go up. The speed and power possible with this movement makes it a useful technique for sharp or loud accents. However, the speed and power of the pushing up movement can be changed so that it can also produce a very soft dynamic level. Downward and upward motions complement one another like breathing in and breathing out. Each serves both as a reaction to and a preparation for the other. So, for example, the downward drop places the arm in a low position and ready to press up and away. Reciprocal downward and upward motions are used in the dynamic shaping of appoggiaturas and other figures where two notes are slurred together. The downward and upward motions can be used to create different emphases. A heavier downward motion creates an accent, while a less energetic upward movement creates a softer sound.
By increasing the force of the upward movement, the balance of emphasis changes. At slower speeds, this combination of downward and upward motion appears as a wrist movement because the wrist flexes conspicuously upward with the second note. However, the movement of the wrist is really a passive reaction to movement coming from the upper arm. Reciprocal upward and downward motions are also useful in patterns of unequal note values. and for dotted rhythms. In these cases, a stronger upward motion is given to the longer note to create an accent. The downward motion is applied to the shorter note value, and it serves as a preparation for the upward motion. The combined motions give an inflection to the figure as well as fluency and ease where these patterns are used repeatedly. Upward and downward motions create different sensations and contrasting sounds. This means that they may be used to create different patterns of emphasis, not only in melodic shaping, but also in chordal playing. The simplest case would be that of a cadence, in which the two chords move from tension, produced by an upward motion, to resolution with a downward motion. A downward drop of weight into the keyboard brings about an upward rebound that is spontaneous and immediate. For this reason, distinguishing between downward and upward motion is sometimes elusive, but this feature is also the basis of another technique, that of vibration. Vibration is a staccato or non-legato touch that consists of a fast bounce a rebound from the keys following the impact of the fingers reaching the key bed when the keys are depressed. It is useful in passages that require loudness, speed, and sharp articulation of every note. It can be used in staccato or non-legato soft passages. It can strengthen a crescendo. And it can improve coordination in double note passages. It enhances ease and endurance by reclaiming from the keyboard some of the energy expended in playing. Vibration requires a free arm and wrist that are able to react as each finger reaches the keybed. Each impact produces an upward impulse, which serves as a preparation for the downward motion that follows. The combination of downward gravity and upward impulse create a sensation somewhat like a self-perpetuating loop with the effort of playing reduced to a light placement and motion of the fingers. Rotation is a side-to-side -side motion that involves pronation and supination of the hand and forearm. Pronation turns the palm of the hand downward. Supination turns it upward. With these two, the arm can make the hand rock back and forth. When the arm turns in the direction of supination, the thumb side of the hand rises up while the fifth finger goes down. When the arm turns in the direction of pronation, the fifth finger side of the hand rises up and the thumb goes down. Rotation lends fluency, ease, power, and stamina in performing broken intervals.
rotation is sometimes described as a forearm motion. However, Arau asked rotation include the upper arm as well, turning the whole arm from the shoulder socket. This type of rotation, including the upper arm, is designed to correct an imbalance that occurs with forearm rotation alone. Forearm rotation alone is enough to turn the palm of the hand upward. In piano playing, this moves the thumb quite high, giving the thumb a wide range of motion and a lot of power. But once the forearm reaches a position where the palm of the hand is downward, its two bones, the radius and the ulna, are crossed so that now they form an X. The forearm alone can rotate no further than this, but in this position, the fifth finger is not raised above the keys very much. Therefore, the fifth finger does not gain wide range of motion or power from forearm rotation. However, the finger, fifth finger can be raised higher by rotating the upper arm from the shoulder socket. This turns the point of the elbow somewhat outward. Upper arm rotation, therefore, gives equal advantage to the fifth finger and the thumb. When upper arm rotation is used in actual playing, the arm is suspended somewhat above the keyboard and away from the body with the wrist high and the hand sloping slightly downward. Upper arm rotation can be seen in a small movement in the upper arm. Circular motion combines elements of rotation and vertical motion. It is useful for repeated stepwise or arpeggiated patterns of notes moving in the same direction. Circular motion might be seen as vertical movement applied to the beginning and ending of each note pattern with rotation to connect the inner notes, round the leaps between note groups, and connect them into longer gestures. Circular motion follows the structure of the hand. When the fingers are outstretched, the tips represent points along a curved line. When the arm moves with this curve while playing, it describes a circular motion. Although circular movement may appear most conspicuously in the wrist, it is essentially an upper arm motion with the wrist moving passively in response. Circular motion may be either outward, with the wrist rising upward and away from the body, or inward, with the wrist rising upwards and towards the body.